Radhe Radhe Govinda Govinda Radhe 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 Krishna Maharaj. Oh, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Can you hear me okay, Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj, we can hear you. Please accept my humble obeisances. Welcome to Kanya Desh Yatra once again. Please accept my obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Maharaj, please, five minutes. People are joining. Okay, Prabhu. Wait, I'll wait five minutes, yeah. Thank you. 
കേൾക്കാനില്ല Hare Krishna all devotees we are waiting for the devotees to join another one more minute we will wait Hare Krishna Welcome you all for this wonderful evening of Srila Prabhupada's Vyas Puja We are so fortunate to have His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinash Narasimha Swami Maharaj with us And Maharaj is a disciple of Srila Prabhupada and maharaj took initiation in 1971 in london and afterwards he took the second initiation after one year maharaj was preaching all over asian countries last 25 years he is preaching in india philippines china taiwan singapore hong kong malaysia and thailand and we can see a big devotees in china and we practically saw these devotees when we are going to mayapur we cannot believe how many chinese devotees are coming to iskon so it is very grateful contribution from maharaj and through his years of preaching he has given countless souls practical guidance and deep inspiration taking sanyasa in mayapur in 1994 from tamal krishna goswami maharaj and maharaj is teaching in mayapur institute also from the beginning and presently maharaj is situated in mayapur so we are so fortunate and maharaj accepted our invitation and joining us today for this wonderful evening of our sri la propas vyas puja glorification so we all together kanya desh devotees can welcome maharaj by chanting hare krishna mahamantra three times 
हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा महाराज हरे कृष्णा सो आई कैन बिगिन नाउ हरे कृष्णा प्रभु कैन आई बिगिन नाउ एस महाराज यू कैन नाउ बिगिन महाराज ओके थैंक यू ओम ज्ञान अतिमरंदस्य ज्ञानंजन शलाकाय च नमस्ते सरस्वती गौरवाचारिणेशिणे प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधारी गौरभक्त बिंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे सो ऑन दिस सस्पेशियस डे वी आर रिमेंबरिंग हाउ शिल प्रोपट अपीयर्ड इन दिस वर्ल्ड इन द ईयर 1896 इन द सिटी ऑफ कोलकाता शिल प्रोपट वाज बोर्न इन अ वैष्णव फैमिली his father would worship radha krishna deities every day and shrul prabha told us when he was a young boy he would always see his father every day offer obeisances to his deities and perform aarti for the deities so shrul prabha remembered how his father was a vaishnava just like Prabhupada's own spiritual master Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati he was also of course born in a Vaishnava family his father was Bhakti Vinod Thakur so Srila Prabhupada told us he said actually everything which he learned from his spiritual master he had already learned from his own father his own father had taught him to worship the deity his father had taught him the importance of the vedic culture and the vaishnava principles of cleanliness mercy austerity and truthfulness his father had made sure that his son could play madanga nicely and he could also play harmonium very expertly his father never wanted him to grow up to be a worldly person at one point they were thinking to send our bhakti vinanta swami prabhupad to the west to get more education and become a lawyer but his father would not allow it he said i don't want my son to become like that so prabhupad took those words of his father to heart and he respected his father he dedicates his krishna book to his father because he understood his father was also a pure devotee so great devotees they're born into vaishnava families it's a very good opportunity from birth to be born in a vaishnava family because from the very beginning of one's life one has the opportunity to take up the spiritual culture and to learn the basics of spiritual life shri lopal told us he said 
you know, his friends, when he was growing up, his friends, they had all kinds of bad habits. But he said, in my whole life, I never ever even tasted tea. At one point, when he was a child, he had some ty typhoid fever. And the do doctor was brought. The doctor was some Western doctor. And he had prescribed, he told Abbas, he told Prabhupada's father, he said, you have to give him chicken soup. And of course, uh, Prabhupada's father said, well, we're vegetarian. We don't eat chicken. We don't eat these things. He said, if you don't give it, it's going to die. So it was very frightening to hear this. And so somehow they made arrangements. They prepared some chicken soup. And when they tried to offer it, tried to feed it into the mouth of Abai, uh, Prabhupada, he vomited. So then when he vomited, then they understood, no, we're not going to give this to him. And he recovered. So that was an indication, something of his purity. Another significant point about the, the birth of Srila Prabhupada, he was born in the year 1896. It was in that same year which Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur had began trying to preach in Western countries. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur had written a book about Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in English, and he sent copies of it to universities in the West. One such university was McGill University in Canada. And when the devotees went there, they found in the library, they actually discovered this, this book sent by Bhaktivinoda Thakur still there in the library. So Bhak Prabhupada, of course, described Bhaktivinoda Thakur as the pioneer of preaching Krishna consciousness in the Western world. It was very significant that he was born in the, the same year in which Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur began trying to preach in the West. So Srila Prabhupada had a lot of connection with book distribution. He grew up as a student. He studied at the Scottish Churches College, and he was able to study English language and Sanskrit, and he had a very good education. Many of his teachers were British teachers, because at that time, India was under the British rule. So the teachers were very well trained, they could speak not only English, they could speak also Bengali. And uh, Srila Prabhupada took advantage of the education there to study and master Sanskrit as well as English. Srila Prabhupada often impressed devotees with his knowledge of European history and English literature, he studied everything and studied it very well. You know, when, when I go to when I went to school, the things I learned at school, I've forgotten everything. I don't remember. But Srila Prabhupada, he knew, he remembered them. He could remember dates of different historic battles, and he remembered the, the stories behind different English novels, different dramas which he studied. So he took advantage of these things for Krishna consciousness, to preach Krishna consciousness. He was never attracted to the Western life. The teachers, they were Christians, and they would sometimes try to convert the students towards the Christian philosophy. But Srila Prabhupada was never influenced by their preaching. He could understand how limited their knowledge was. They would say that, where is the witness? Where is the witness to our past activities? But Srila Prabhupada would say, yeah, there are many witnesses. The Lord is there as a witness, the Paramatma, the Lord in the heart. The devas are there, the different demigods, devatas, 
They're the witnesses. They see everything. We should never think there's no witness. There are many witnesses to everything we do. And we get the reactions. We are rewarded for the pious and we're punished for the sin. So Srila Prabhupada was a follower of Gandhi at this time. And uh, he had gone to college. In the same college, there was also this uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, who was very militant and who was founding the Indian Independent Army. So it, there was a very radical mood there in Bengal at that time. And Srila Prabhupada himself, as a follower of Gandhi, he would dress in khadi. Because Gandhi would tell people, don't wear this synthetic cloth, these things which are imported from Europe. Better that you wear what's made in India. And better to wear what's made in the, in the villages. The cottage industries are producing good cloth in the form of khadi. We should use that. So Srila Prabhupada, he would dress himself in the khadi, go to college like this. So while he was living in Calcutta, one of his friends requested him to come and meet a very holy sadhu who had come there to Calcutta. But when Srila Prabhupada was invited, he said, oh, no, no, I don't want to go. I, I've met so many sadhus. I know these different sadhus. I'm not impressed with these people. I'm not going to come. But his friend insisted, that, no, you have to come. This is a real sadhu. He's a real holy man. You must come and meet him. He's so, he's so powerful. And so somehow or other, his friend was able to coerce Prabhupada and bring him there. It was in Calcutta, a place called Otadanga Road. We have that property today. In recent times, the Iskon Temple in Calcutta acquired that property and they're developing it. They want to make it a holy place because it was actually a place of Prabhupada's pastime. He met his spiritual master there for the first time. So he came into the room, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati. He had been staying in Mayapur and doing great austerities in Mayapur for several years. He'd taken a vow to chant the holy name many, many crores of times. And so it, was take, it took him several years. And so he was living there in Mayapur practically on his own and he was taking care of the, the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because his own father, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, had constructed an, a small temple there at the Yoga Peak. And Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was living there, taking care of the temple and doing his chanting every day. Practically, he was living alone, under, un, almost living under an umbrella, performing great austerities. But, but he was convinced to come to Calcutta and begin his preaching. So it was at this time that our own Abhay Charan Bhaktivedanta Swami met. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. And when he came into the room, immediately Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati addressed them, him, Prabhupada, and his friend. He said, you are nice young men. Why don't you preach the message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? So Prabhupada just walked in the room. He, he didn't know what, what? This man's telling me to preach the message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? So he began to argue with them. He told them, no, no, how we can preach the message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Our country is not, not free yet. We're still slaves under the British Empire. We need to get independence for our country. Then only we can preach Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's message. But Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati argued back because Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati he was a nice tika brahmachari and he was very powerful. He could argue very strongly and he was very erudite, very scholarly, and he was very powerful in preaching. And people would run away from him in fear. He was so powerful. 
So he argued back, no, you're wrong. The, the message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu cannot wait for some political adjustment. You have to take it up now, it's urgent. We have to preach this message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to the world and explain to people the real goal of life. We cannot simply wait for some political adjustment. There will always be some problems in the material world. We cannot allow ourselves to be influenced by these different political issues. We have to teach, we have to preach this Lord Chaitanya's mission. Very important. So Srila Prabhupada said, I was impressed. I was defeated by his arguments. And I understood that he was a very great personality. And from that very first meeting, I accepted him as my spiritual master. There was no formal initiation or anything, but just Srila Prabhupada understood that this Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada he is very, very powerful. He is very pure. He is very great personality. And he accepted him. But Srila Prabhupada said, at that time, I was a young man. I had a young family, just married. I couldn't really think about preaching much. Anyway, Srila Prabhupada had, after some time, he left Calcutta and gone to live in Allahabad. He opened his own business there in Allahabad, a place called, he opened a, place, a business called Prayak Pharmacy. And he was making a living there. He was thinking, I will make money and I can use it for some good work, to do some good things, to help some uh, good causes, like some spiritual preaching. So he was living in Allahabad and it happened that the Godiamat came there to begin a center. And the devotees, when they came to Allahabad, they were introduced to Bhaktivedanta Swami Pro Abhai Charan, Abhai Charan Day. They were introduced to him. They were told he's a Bengali and he's very pious, very religious man. He will help you. So when they met him, then Srila Prabhupada remembered how he'd met Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati in Calcutta and he understood these were the same people. So he was very happy and he began to go and visit their center. Prabhupada of course had five children, three boys, and he used to take his children with him, his sons especially, he would take them to the temple. Srila Prabhupada would often play danga at the temple. Srila Prabhupada was very expert in playing Madanga. And he was also expert in harmonium as well as Sanskrit. Many of the devotees, even the full-time devotees, they didn't know Sanskrit. But Srila Prabhupada, Bhaktivedanta Swami, Abhai Charan, as he was called at that time, he knew Sanskrit. So they were impressed. So uh, he was initiated. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati came there in 1933. Srila Prabhupada took initiation from Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. And at the time of initiation, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati remarked that he said, Yes, I have noted this man. He likes to hear. Lord Chaitanya always gave great importance to hearing. This, the, big, the real beginning of the process of devotion is by hearing. When we hear submissively, then we can cultivate our Krishna consciousness. So Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati said, yes, I noted this man. He likes to hear. He does not go away. Other people, they come and hear a little while, they go away. They get restless. They're not able to sit and hear. Their minds are disturbed. But Bhaktisanta Sarasati saw in Abhai Charan that he likes to hear. And when he initiated him, he changed his name from Abhai Charan, became Abhai Charanaravinda Das, right? The fearless lotus feet. Before it was Abhai Charan, it became Abhai Charanaravinda Das. 
So he was initiated. He got twice, both initiations at the one time. And uh, at that time, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati also told him that you should study the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu by Rupa Goswami. That this is a very important book and it outlines all the yoga. So you see that when Srila Prabhupada went to the West, one of the first books which he published was The Nectar of Devotion, which is a summary study of the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Srila Prabhupada always followed all the orders of his spiritual master. He did not get much association with his spiritual master. He was initiated in 1933. In 1936, his spiritual master left the world. Srila Prabhupada said, I was with him only four or five times before he departed. But he said, I never forgot his instructions. And before, just, just before Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati left the world, Abhay Charanara Vinda, Srila Prabhupada, wrote to his guru and asked him, he said, please tell me how I can serve you. He said, I see you have many sannyasis around you who are serving you. But he said, I'm a householder. I'm in family life. How can I serve you? What should I do to help to serve you? So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati wrote back to him and told him that because you know English language, that you're very proficient in the English language, it will be very good for you to try to preach in the English language because English is like an international language. So I recommend you that you try to do some preaching in this English language. So Srila Prabhupada, that was 1936, Bhaktisiddhanta left the world at the end of the year, 1936. And Srila Prabhupada greatly lamented the departure of his spiritual master. And he even, he greatly lamented even more when he saw the movement which his spiritual master had set up in the form of the Gaudiya Math, when he saw it disintegrate because the different leaders did not follow the instructions of Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati. Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati had said, no one person should become in charge. Hare Krishna. Hare I think some Hare Krishna. some network issues there. Maharaj is not visible now. We will wait for Maharaj to come back. Okay, but we will wait. Thank you.
Maharaj is having some internet issues. Please wait. Haribo! Haribo! Hare Krishna Maharaj! Hare Krishna Prabhu! Hare Krishna, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, so, sorry, we've got a, a technical problem there. Can everyone hear now? You okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Maharaj, we can hear you. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So, sorry, that's the Wi-Fi in India. Sometimes it's like that. So, we were talking about Srila Prabhupada, how he didn't meet his Guru Maharaj very much. Sannyasis, they met him many times, but he didn't meet very much. So, then he got the letter. His Guru Maharaj told him, you try to preach in English. So Prabhupada took up that, 1944. 1936, his guru left the world. 1944, Srila Prabhupada began printing his English magazine called Back to Godhead. That was in, he was in Calcutta at that time. But it was not very easy for him. He did everything. He wrote the articles, he printed it, and he distributed it. He would go and sit in the tea shop. He would sit in the tea shop without even drinking tea. And he, when people would come in, he would go and sit with them and try to sell them a magazine and ask them to take a subscription for the magazine. So he was doing like that. He print one, some of the articles were there, things like Ishopanishad, his purports to Ishopanishad were printed in the Back to Godhead magazine. Later on, when he went to the West, he put them in a book, small book. Somebody actually told him, they said to Prabhupada, they said that, you know, why, why, why you print little newspapers? Is it better you write books? Books will be more lasting. These 
newspapers, they can easily get lost. But if you print a book, if you make it a book, it will be more powerful, will have more effect. So then Srila Prabhupada began writing some books and the first canto of Bhagavatam was gradually produced. Of course, he was living at home. At some point, the business failed. So when the business failed, he had problems with the family. He decided better to leave the home. And he went to live in Vrindavan. He went to live in Vrindavan and he was given different services. Sometimes he'd be the editor of the magazine or the newspaper, which the different temple with the Gaudiya Math was producing. He would try to do some different services there, but was not very satisfying. He wanted to do more. He wanted to do more, just like the what he was saying, you know, after Prabhupada had gone to the West, and then he'd come back to India, to Vrindavan. He brought the devotees to Vrindavan. And they were thinking to make a center in Vrindavan. So the American devotees, they said, let's just get a small place in, Bag in, in Loi Bazaar. Because the, most of the temples of the Goswamis are there in Loi Bazaar. They're small places. They're not very big. Things like Radha Damodar, you know, a small place. So said, let's get a place like that. But... Prabhupada said to them, no, he said, I cannot think small, I have to do something big. So Prabhupada had that kind of ambition, he wanted to do something really big, you know, he didn't like to do small things. That was his nature, he had that kind of mood all the time, he was always trying to do something big. So he would challenge, tell the devotees, sometimes he'd say to devotees, what, if, what is the good of you being an American if you cannot do something wonderful for Krishna? Like that. <laughs> you know, he'd really challenge, really push the devotees that you, you, know, you have to do something big. And he liked to do something really big. It, it gave him that satisfaction when he tried, when he tried to do something big. Prabhupada gave the example he said, just like if you go hunting, he said, if you go hunting for rabbits and you miss, people will laugh at you. But if you go hunting for a rhinoceros, then people will say, well, it's very difficult, very difficult. You went for rhino. So <laughs> Prabhupada's like that. He was always thinking big. He wanted to hunt for things like rhinos. He wanted big results. And he expected devotees to do some, something big for Krishna. So Prabhupada had a lot of struggles in the beginning. He had left home and he was living in Vrindavan. Finally, he got convinced he had to take sannyas and he checked with his god brother Keshava Maharaj who had a temple there in Mathura and he told him, he said, I'm having this dream a couple, a few times. My Guru Maharaj came to me, told me that I should take sannyas. And so Keshava Maharaj said, yes, very good, because Srila Prabhupada was already, he was already in his 60s, his so old age. And although he had a wife and family, he'd been away from home for some time. So he was confident that he could maintain the vow of sannyas. So he encouraged him to take sannyas. So it, I think it was 1955, he took sannyas on the day of Mahotsab, and he took sannyas from Keshava Maharaj in Mathura. And after taking sannyas, then he continued his writing and he was able to publish three volumes, the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam in three volumes. And he got, he had to get supporters, he had to get donors. And one of the donors for printing the Srimad Bhagavatam was the lady who was the chairman of the Sindhya Shipping Company, a lady called Srimati Morariji, and she was a great devotee of Srinathji and a follower of Balabhacharya. So Srila Prabhupada had gone there to Mumbai and he'd been able to meet her and the lady was very respectful to him and she donated for the printing of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So then it happened that 
another man, a, a Mr. Agarwal, who Prabhupada had met in, in Delhi or somewhere in UP, he, he, he said, my son is in America. So when he said, my son is in America, Prabhupada immediately said to him, he said, tell your son to sponsor me, to come there to America and I will come there to America and I can preach Krishna consciousness there. And so he, Prabhupada said like that to this man and never thought any more about it. But it was a surprise after a few months, the man came and said, my son has sent the sponsorship for you now. The sponsorship has come through that now he's, he's sponsoring you to go to America. But of course, he, Prabhupada had to arrange his own travel. He, he, the son is not going to pay for his fare. So, <laughs> Prabhupada had no money hardly at all. He was just living from day to day. How to go to America. And so then he... Her, let me go on your ship. So she was very reluctant. She thought, you know, you're an old man, 70 years old, not very good for you to go to America. Why you go to that place? You better you just stay here and die here in India. Why you go there to America to die? Better you stay here. But Prabh Prabhupada said, No, I have to go. My spiritual master has ordered me. So anyway, she agreed. She said, okay, you go, I'll give you a return trip so you can come back. Don't stay too long. So Srila Prabhupada was, took the boat, crossed the Atlantic. The captain of the ship was a person called Captain Pandya, and he was also a pious man. Actually, before Prabhupada got off the ship, he put just one set of Srimad Bhagavatams and he gave Prabhupada 20 American dollars. And that was the only money Prabhupada had for his coming into America. He didn't have any money. He had maybe 40 rupees Indian money. And then he got $20 by selling a set of books. So how was Prabhupada going to live in America? Well, he brought with him, he'd arranged to bring with him some cases of Bhagavatams, because he printed several volumes. So he's, he printed three volumes, and he printed like a thousand copies of each. So there were many books not sold. So he arranged, when he went on the boat, he arranged for many of the bo books to be packed in boxes, and he brought them with him to America. And while he was in America, he would regularly, whenever you'd have a program, you'd give a lecture, and he would offer books for sale. And similarly, when he got at the center there in New York, he would try, they would try to sell the books. It was the only books they had in the beginning, three volumes of Bhagavatam printed in India. But somehow Prabhupada was able to distribute and he would also, Prabhupada would also go himself to the bookstores and try to meet the people in the bookstores and get them to take the books. And he would even cook prasadam. He would prepare some samosas and take them with him. And when he would go to the bookstores, he would give the people in the bookstore, he'd give them some samosa, give them prasadam, and encourage them to try to sell his books. So you can see everything which we're doing, we learn from Prabhupada. Prabhupada used to do all, all of these things. He taught the devotees everything, how to play the madanga, how to cook, how to bathe. We didn't know anything. Srila Prabhupada was surprised how people in the West, often their homes didn't even have places for bathing. He was thinking America to be opulent, but he saw really not so opulent, not so rich. So many, so many, uh, so many things were lacking in the Western culture. Before Prabhupada had gone to America, he had met with one Swamiji from the Ramakrishna Ashram, and the man had told him that if you're going to the West, you better learn to use a knife and fork, because everyone in the West, they use two hands, they eat with two hands, they use in one hand a knife, 
one hand fork. But Srila Prabhupada said, I'm not going to teach, I'm not going to learn from them, I'm going to teach them. And Srila Prabhupada did that. He taught the devotees how to eat. You know, he would train the devotees, you eat with one hand, you don't eat with the left hand. The left hand's unclean. You only touch the food with the right hand. And you don't put the hands in the mouth. You drop the food in the mouth. So Srila Prabhupada was training the devotees see things. He didn't try to learn from the West. He came to teach the West. And he taught the devotees so many wonderful things of the Vedic culture. So it, the, the amazing thing is that Srila Prabhupada could bring people like myself from the lowest level he could bring us to the platform of Krishna consciousness, which is such an exalted level. When Srila Prabhupada disappeared from the world, I remember one of his god brothers came and he, he said that this uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami, he, he has brought the highest, the highest thing to the lowest level because he's made Krishna consciousness available for everyone, for all these people from the West who have no culture. He's given them this Krishna consciousness. So he's done this kind of thing. We have to understand that Prabhupada's godbrother was not actually praising Prabhupada. In some ways, he was kind of ridiculing Prabhupada. You know, he was saying that, you know, this Swamiji is, he's brought the highest thing to the lowest level, giving Krishna consciousness to all the. Prabhupada's greatness, that Prabhupada could bring Krishna consciousness to that, to everyone. He could make it available to everyone. Other people, many of Prabhupada's God brothers, they only wanted to see. Many of them even vowed never to leave Avan, just to stay in the Holy Dham. But Prabhupada taught us that our job is not just to stay in Vrindavan ourselves, but to give Vrindavan to others, to give to others Vrindavan. So Srila Prabhupada had many wonderful pastimes in the Western world. He was always preaching and inspiring the devotees by his own example. He worked tirelessly. Practically, he gave up He said, he said one time, he said, uh, while I was a young man, I gave up mating and defending. He said, now in my old age, I have, I've also given up eating and sleeping. Actually, Srila Prabhupada hardly slept. Rest about 10 o'clock at night and wake up at midnight. And at midnight, then he would begin his translation. So he just rest for a couple of hours in the night. His real work was translating the books, writing the book. He would feel very pleased. He would know that this is very satisfying to my spiritual master. So Srila Prabhupada encouraged us. And in fact, it was the instruction of his own spiritual master. He told them that to print books. He said, don't worry, you don't have to worry about big temples. Uh, big temples, when a big temple was donated to the Gaudiya Mat in Calcutta, a very nice big building in Calcutta, 
And when they got that big building, then the devotees began to argue about which room I would have and which room they should, the other person should have. Each one wanted to get facility for their own eating and sleeping to be comfortable. So Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, when he heard this, he was very disappointed. And he said, better they sell the building and use it to print books. And indeed, whenever they had a temple with money, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati would come there would spend it. He would put on a big exhibition of Lord Chaitanya's Leela and he would invite people to come and he would distribute prasadam to everyone. And the devotees would complain that Guru Maharaj, you're spending all the money. There's no money left for the temple. Good. So similarly, our own spiritual master, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, he didn't worry about buildings and bricks and cement. He liked to print books. Union. Srila Prabhupada was a pioneer. He had gone to Russia in 1971. He'd gone there and he'd met the first, he'd met one Russian young man and he'd inspired that man and he had initiated him and given them instructions. And that one man did a lot of preaching in Russia and helped to Krishna conscious centers around Russia. Even though Russia at that time was a communist country and were very severe punishments for people who were teaching any kind of spiritual practice. And actually this one devotee who Prabhupada met, he was imprisoned and he was put in psychi psychi psychiatric hospitals and he was given different drugs to from thinking about Krishna consciousness. So the, the boy actually was persecuted a lot for practicing and for spreading Krishna consciousness. But he was, he, he certainly got a lot of mercy from Srila Prabhupada took a lot of risks. One devotee was uh, talking with Prabhupada. Prabhupada had been describing, he said, you know, when I was a young man, I climbed up on top of the Victoria Memorial in Calcutta. And so when the devotee heard this, he said to Prabhupada, he said, he said, really, you climbed up on top of that Victoria Memorial? You must have been very brave. And Prabhupada said, yes. He said, did I not go to, did I not go to America when I was 70 with no money? You have to be brave to do that kind of thing. You have to have that kind of courage, not easy things to do, to go off to the West, to foreign countries, not knowing anybody. So Srila Prabhupada, he could do it. He did it. He went there to America. He was, first of all, he was staying with one family. This man, Mr. Agarwal, his son was there and his son had married an American woman. So Prabhupada came there to their home and they arranged for Prabhupada. They, they rented a, a room in the YMCA. And Prabhupada stayed there and he would come to their home every day and cook for them. And when Prabhupada would cook, then the Agarwals decided his cooking was better than what they were eating. And they would eat their meals with Prabhupada. They were inspired to eat Prabhupada's Bengali cooking. They enjoyed it so much. And they arranged programs for Prabhupada. Prabhupada would go and speak. They even arranged a newspaper reporter to come and a very nice article was printed about Prabhupada. But Prabhupada was in a small town, could not do very much. So he went to New York. And in New York, he had one contact. There was one man, Mishra, also Bengali. He had a yoga studio there in New York, he established a yoga ashram. And Prabhupada had his name and somehow he was able to contact him. So this Mr. Dr. Mishra, 
was called. He allowed Prabhupada to come and he arranged accommodation for him while he was in New York. And Prabhupada would try to preach there in the yoga ashram. He would do some kirtan, play the harmonium and sing some bhajans, Bengali bhajan, and then he would preach. But whenever he would preach, then Dr. Mishra would get upset because this Dr. Mishra was a big Mayavadi. So he didn't like Prabhupada to preach. He'd say, oh, do more kirtan, Swamiji, do more kirtan. Prabhupada would be preaching Vaishnava philosophy. But Dr. Mishra was a big Mayavadi, he didn't like to hear the Vaishnava philosophy. So he tried to get, he would discourage Prabhupada. Prabhupada would say to him, your name is Mishra. Lord Chaitanya's father was Jagannath Mishra. He said, you should also preach the message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. You're also Mishra. This is your family name, your culture. You should help me to preach Lord Chaitanya's mission. But Dr. Mishra found it difficult to accept. So, uh, like this, Prabhupada struggled, but then he went down to New York, down to the Lower East Side, where the young people were, and almost immediately he got a response. Young people started to come. People, somebody saw him in the street, and someone he said, are you from India? And he said, of course, Prabhupada said, yes, I'm from India. He said, the young man said, oh, I've been to India. I've been, uh, you know, I'm very, I, I'm so interested in Indian culture. And so then Prabhupada invited him to come to the center. He'd rented a very small shop front, little store, shop front. And uh, the name of the shop was called Matchless Gifts. So Srila Prabhupada kept that name. So yeah, this is a nice name for our center. And he began to have programs there like three times a week and people would come and Prabhupada would give a lecture and then he'd have an apple and he would cut the apple into pieces and give everyone a piece of an apple. And then he would, he would pass a basket around and ask everyone to give some donation. And in this way, somehow Prabhupada was maintaining himself but gradually, gradually, more and more people started to come. And Prabhupada was playing a bongo drum. He had no madanga. He was just beating an African bongo drum. But they were having kirtan. And people were really taking to it. They were enjoying it. And then Prabhupada would cook. He would show them how to make chapati and dal and rice and sabji and samosa and pakora, all of these things. And people loved the prasada. And Prabhupada would train all the young devotees how to cook. And in this way, Krishna consciousness was beginning. More and more people were coming. And Prabhupada was continuing. He began to continue back to Godhead there in New York. They got a little printing machine, print one page at a time and put it together, staple it together. And the devotees would go out and try to sell it. This was the beginning of Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada, of course, began the Sankirtan. They went to the park in New York. Prabhupada was alone in the beginning, under a tree. He began there, he was chanting there, and young people came and they began to dance around him. So this was the beginning of Krishna consciousness consciousness and it's still it's going on today just the same way just as Srila Prabhupada established it we try to continue to chant and to hear tell people about Krishna to print books to distribute prasada of course this year a little difficult with so many problems with this COVID virus but still we're trying to use technology Prabhupada taught us, said, we're not afraid of technology. We can use technology in the service of Krishna. So we're doing that. We're using the Zoom in the service of Krishna, trying to continue everything Srila Prabhupada gave us. So on this very auspicious day of Prabhupada's appearance, we're praying that we can continue to utilize our time 
in this world in the service of Krishna and Srila Prabhupada. Service to Srila Prabhupada is definitely very beneficial for our spiritual life. It said, of all kinds of worship, the worship of Vishnu is the greatest. Even greater than the worship of Vishnu is the worship of those things in relationship to Vishnu, which means Vishnu's devotees. So if we worship Srila Prabhupada, take up Srila Prabhupada's mission, try to follow Srila Prabhupada's instruction, it's very pleasing to the Supreme Lord Krishna. So we encourage all of you to take advantage of this very, very special day to be Krishna, to think of Prabhupada, read Prabhupada's books, remember how much Prabhupada sacrificed his life to begin this Krishna consciousness movement. So he did it for our benefit so that we could have a better life. So I hope your life is also better by the grace of Srila Prabhupada. So we'll stop now because our time is limited. You probably have other things to do. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank Hare you. Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu. Can we make some questions? Yeah, some questions, yeah. Maharaj? Yeah, any questions? Okay. Anybody? If anybody is having questions, please uh, raise your hand and you can ask. Hare Krishna Maharaj Dhanavat Pranam. Hare Krishna Prabhu Dhanavat Pranam. Please accept my humble obeisances at your lotus feet, Maharaj. Maharaj, I want to ask one question that uh, you have glorified Srila Prabhupada, uh, like how Prabhupada Ji has, uh, uh, he went to Western and uh, Western culture and he preached the message of Krishna conscious there. When we hear the Prabhupada uh, pastimes, we feel so much encouraged. We feel so much enthusiastic at that moment. But uh, we are in this material world. We see that uh, uh, when we are uh, contact with this material people, then that, that enthusiasm and that uh, uh, encouragement that uh, we get within the association and by the hearing the lecture of Srila Prabhupada, we see that is not 100%. So how uh, one can progress so that what we are hearing seriously and sincerely we can adopt in our personal life with facing so much material difficulties. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yes, we face a lot of material difficulties <laughs> due to the, the environment, very unhealthy, unnatural environment. It doesn't make it easy for us to be Krishna conscious. So we have to do our best to try to really take up Krishna consciousness in the most enthusiastic manner, remembering Srila Prabhupada's teachings. Srila Prabhupada never compromised. I was saying, how the Ramakrishna mission were saying, you should use a knife and fork. Prabhupada said, I'm not going to learn from them. I'm going to teach them. So that's an important point in associating with other people, materialistic people. We shouldn't think that we, there's anything we can learn from these people in material life. We, we have to give them mercy. We have to show them the real culture, the real mercy. Not that, maybe, of course, they're not always so rare as Christian. We have to become expert in cultivating their mood for Krishna consciousness. Srila Prabhupada was very expert, very patient in dealing with people, talking with them. You know, different people would come. I remember bringing the life member to Calcutta.
Prabhupada in Calcutta and Prabhupada met him and his wife and Prabhupada would, oh, how, what is your business? And Prabhupada would ask about his business. And, and another time in England, Prabhupada met this man, one man, he was actually a very famous man. He was a, a world champion motor car driver, motor racing, Grand Prix racing. And Prabhupada met him and Prabhupada was talking to him and Prabhupada would talk about death. And of course, the motor car driving the car at high speed, you're often close to death. So the man could immediately pick up on death that this is a, you know, a very important subject and Prabhupada could relate to him a lot of spiritual knowledge. So like that, we have to, we have to be a little intelligent about how we associate with non-devotees and how, the, how we can actually give them the right mood, the right impression. Now, another example was there in the land at Juhu. When the devotees first purchased the land at Juhu, Srila Prabhupada, you had the devotees that initially they'd been living downtown in a condominium, but then he brought them up to Juhu and they had to live in tents. And they put tents up on the land and the devotees were living in a very simple, primitive condition. And there were tenants on the land living in buildings there. And they were not very happy that these Westerners have come here. That now they've taken over, that they're our landlord. We don't really want them here and everything. But when Prabhupada came, you know, Prabhupada could, he, just by being friendly with them and talking to them and explaining Krishna consciousness to them, that people could accept it, that they could change. That in the beginning, they were very antagonistic and spiteful. They didn't like devotees. But after they met Prabhupada and they saw Prabhupada giving sweet balls to the children and everything, then they, they and they heard Prabhupada's lectures and they could understand this is something very real, very genuine. And they could understand how these Westerners have been influenced by this Swamiji, by his speaking, that he's very powerful. And so they, the, the neighbors all changed and they became friendly. They became friends of the devotees and helped the devotees. So it was all due to Prabhupada, how he related to people. So we have to be intelligent how to make friends with people, how to bring them to become friends. And then it will be so much easier for them to accept Krishna consciousness. But if we are inimical to them, if we're antagonistic, if we make enemies, then it would be very difficult. So it's really important to know how to deal nicely with people caring for people, caring for people so that you can develop a nice relationship, a nice rapport. And even though they may not become devotees, at least they will respect the devotee. So that's important. So we try to do like that. You know, we want to show the people, show the public a nice example, behave nicely and give them the right impression of Krishna consciousness. I hope that helps you a little bit, Prabhu. Thank I know you so much, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so difficult. much, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Living, working in the middle. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Any other question? Manoharani Madhaji. Yes, Prabhuji. Uh, Maharaj, my humble obeisances at your holy feet. Thank you for uh, giving such nice, wonderful, inspirational messages from Srila Prabhupada's life and teachings. Uh, I was able to see Srila Prabhupada when you were speaking about him. Thank you so much, Maharaj. My question is, like, we are part of ISKCON and we are maximum trying to be Krishna conscious all throughout our day. And but what I want, I'm very concerned about my parents. Uh, they are pious, but you know, the intensity of Krishna consciousness that we practice in our daily life is not there in them. So, 
uh, i'm concerned about there because time is running out even for me then what to say about my parents so what could i do for them what can i do for their uh, spiritual advancement and krishna can protect them always what can i do maharaj kindly guide hari krishna well, thank you well hari krishna just like pralad maharaj you know his father was very demonic and very inimical to you know he tried to kill vishnu he fought with lord narsingh dev but pralad delivered his father because pralad was a pure devotee lord narsingh dev said you don't have to worry about your father going to hell because you're a devotee not only your father but for many generations your family members are all delivered so if you become a very good devotee yourself that will deliver your parents they will get great benefit because you know you they you've come from them so they get a, the benefit they'll get a lot of benefit if you are a good devotee if you give your life for krishna and krishna consciousness then it will be a great help to them i think that's important you may have great difficulty trying to encourage your parents to become devotees late in their life not easy to change people they have their own habits they have their own ideas and thinking but if you yourself are convinced about krishna consciousness and if you sacrifice your life and dedicate your life in krishna consciousness then that will be the greatest benefit for your parents also you can give your pious activities your your devotion can go to the credit of your parents you understand thank yes maharaj thank you so much maharaj i'll do my best hari hari, hari krishna, krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj please accept my humble obeisances Maharaj if time permits could you please narrate any of your personal encounters that you had with Sri La Prabhupada Hare Krishna Okay well I will tell you what happened when I got initiated that uh you know I I I joined in London 1971 I think when I joined we were about 20 devotees there. We were all quite young. Uh there were two ladies, the rest were all men. Two ladies, one was from America, one was from France. And the the English men were mostly they're they all English men mostly. Mostly, maybe a couple from America. But uh so Prabhupada came there and came to give initiate we got initiated i got initiated and several of us maybe about 15 of us got initiated at that time so uh, when we got initiated you know i'd been living in the temple and the temple was really poor you know we didn't have funds uh, i had a job when i joined but they told me give up the job you know we want you to do other things she you don't need this job so anyway i i was making incense we were doing incense business and that was providing some income for the temple but anyway when we got initiated the custom is usually you give guru dakshin but none of us had any money <laughs> none of us even thought about guru dakshin because none of us ever had any money we gave everything that we had we gave everything to the temple you know when i joined and moved into the temple i gave everything i had whatever savings i had and the salaries i got when i resigned from my job i gave it and most of the other boys they were not so well educated and many were younger and they didn't have money either but it was a very joyful life and we were very happy in krishna consciousness so we got initiated and after we got initiated prabhupada said to the temple president he said you know he said i initiated all these men none of them gave me any guru dakshin <laughs> and and the temple president said to prabhupada he said prabhupada they don't have any money they don't have anything to give you <laughs> so prabhupada was <laughs> a little 
they said, well, they said, this, is, this is England, <laughs> this British Empire. They take from everyone. And Prabhupada remembered how, uh, how the British had taken so much of the wealth from India. Even one morning, Prabhupada was on a morning walk in the park, and uh, Prabhupada asked devotee to get him a eucalyptus twig. Now, Prabhupada usually used neem twig in India, but in England there's no neem, but he wanted eucalyptus. So there was a eucalyptus tree, so devotee broke a branch off the tree. But when he broke a branch off the tree, a little branch just to take a twig, policeman immediately came, what are you doing? This is the queen's property. You can't break a, a branch off that tree. It's public property. It's a criminal offense, you know. Policeman really got on very upset. He's going to make a case anyway. He, he let the devotee off that time, but after the policeman went away, Prabhupada remarked to the devotee, he said, he said, these British people, they went to India and they took so much wealth. He said, all the queen's jewels in the queen's crown, it all comes, it all came from India. That big Kohinoor diamond, it came out of India. He said, they've taken everything. We took one twig and they're getting so upset. Just see. <laughs> so Prabhupada had so much humor, yeah. Another time on a morning walk, uh, Prabhupada stopped and he said, he, he, he said, what's this on the ground? It stopped under a tree. There were a lot of bird droppings there on the ground. And Prabhupada said, you see this? He said, what does this tell you? Devotee, devotees didn't know what this he said, Prabhupada, it's bird droppings. Prabhupada said, I know it's bird droppings, you fool. What does it tell you? What's the significance? <laughs> the were, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but to Prabhupada, he said, he said, just see, he said, the birds are coming here every day. They're attached to passing stool in the same place. He said, they're so attached. He said, just like human beings, they're so attached. He said, this is there even in the birds. They become attached to their own little home, their little habits. He said, this is the material world, material life. People become very attached. So this is conditioned life. We have to get free. We want to go back to Godhead. We want to get over this conditioning. We have to become detached. Like this, Prabhupada could use so many examples, things in ordinary life, Prabhupada could uh, relate a Krishna conscious message from it. So it was always very wonderful to be with Prabhupada and to be near him and to hear everything he said. Another time I was on a morning walk with Prabhupada, we were in London in the park and he watched the policeman kick one of the young men who was laying on the ground sleeping there. And Prabhupada said, see, he said, the young man is laying sleeping, the policeman is coming kicking. He said, the young man, he has a home, but his karma does not allow him to enjoy the home. Instead, he is coming to the park to sleep and the policeman is coming to kick him, to wake up. So this is his karma. This is the Yes, cannot enjoy life. He gave the example about Lord Shiva, how one time Lord Shiva was with Parvati and they were approached by a beggar. So Parvati, re revealing her womanly nature, she felt some compassion for the beggar and she pleaded to her husband to give something to help him. So Lord Shiva said, well, watch this. And he took some jewels and he put them inside the fruit. And then he gave the fruit to the beggar. And when he gave the fruit to the beggar, the beggar took the fruit and sold the fruit for a few paisa. The beggar didn't think to see that there's jewels inside the fruit. Lord Shiva told, to, uh, showed this to his wife to explain to his wife that this, this beggar is dest by destiny he is poor. You cannot change 
person's destiny just simply by giving them some charity. The laws of karma are like that. You, you do some charity, it's not going to change their destiny for long. But if you give them Krishna consciousness, then that can really change. That can only Krishna consciousness can uproot all the reactions due to the past sins, can change a person's life completely. So this giving Krishna consciousness is the highest welfare work. So in this way, Srila Prabhupada was encouraging us to preach Krishna consciousness. Another time, a young man came and he was arguing with Prabhupada again and again, argue, whatever Prabhupada would say, the man would argue and argue. The young man didn't want to accept anything Prabhupada said. So Prabhupada kept preaching to him for some time and then Prabhupada decided to go for a walk. And after he went for a walk, he came back. And when he came back, he looked in the temple room and he saw in the temple, the young man was in the temple room dancing and chanting. So Prabhupada was very pleased and he said to the devotees, he said, you see, this is Lord Chaitanya's movement. Lord Chaitanya came to give the chanting of the holy name to everyone. Let, let everyone chant Hare Krishna and be happy. Philosophy is difficult for them to accept. But if they will hear the chanting, take part in the kirtan, then they can be greatly benefited. They can make spiritual advancement. Okay, those are some few things. Thank you very Thank you much. much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Any other so, questions? If it's not there, Amal Arjun Prabhu. Yes, Prabhuji. Yes, Prabhu. Can you do a lot of thanks to Maharaj? Thank you, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna uh, Maharaj, I uh, humble obeisances uh, to your uh, holy feet. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, wonderful, uh, inspiring lecture about uh, Srila Prabhupada's uh, pastimes. There have been so many learning points from uh, what uh, you have uh, given us uh, uh, this evening. So thank you so much again. So hope to have your association uh, more often in the future. And uh, Many thanks once again. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. An honor to be able to address the audience here this evening. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada. Ki. Jai. Jai. Thank you very much, Maharaj. We will do one chakal pataru best. One chakal pataru best. One chakal pataru best. Chakra pas in dhuva vecha. Patita nam pavane bion. Vaishnavi binamo namaha. Jai Gaurapri Maharaj. Nanta Kodi Vaishnavi ki jai. Shumpa Vaishnavi ki jai. Bhakti Vigna Vinash Narasimha Dev Maharaj Ki Jai. Jai. Our association will be continuing our Prabhupada Yaspur. We'll have Abhishekam and followed by glorification from our leaders and our uh, devotees. Then we have offering, Chapanbog offering and Bhajan and Pushpanjali. So please be logged in. We will start the Abhishekam within few minutes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <clears throat> Uh, I'm allowed. I'm allowed. Hare Krishna, anybody can do some Kirtan?
by the time it they will be ready Asima, you can do some kirtan. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Simate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswate Devi Gauravani Pracharini Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pashata Deshadarini Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Sri Vasadi Gura Bhakta Vrinda Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Sri Vasadi Gura Bhakta Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sri Vasadi Ora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama.